I've been teaching a Bible study, and in the Bible study, there have been questions about the future, about the, we might say, eschatology. I put out a number of videos looking at all the different positions, and I'd like to do a short one here focusing on what the amillennial position would teach. I'm not trying to convince anyone into that position, but I think it's only fair that all the positions be understood. Uh, today, in popular evangelical teaching, what we normally hear is a pre-tribulational rapture, followed by a seven-year tribulation period, then Christ returning with the church, and then a thousand-year millennial reign, followed by a new heaven and new earth. That is popular. That is what you find on TV, on radio, etc. The that's one position called the dispensational, pre-tribulational, premillennial theology. Then we have what we would call historic premillennialism, that believes that the church will go through a future tribulation period or the future tribulation period, followed by the return of Christ with his angels, and then a thousand year literal millennial reign uh, on earth in Palestine, followed then by the final judgment, the great white throne, and then the new heaven and new earth. It's called historical because it goes back to uh, a little bit after the first century. Certain uh, early church fathers mentioned that. The, the typical position through the centuries has been the amillennial position and then later the post-millennial. What do we mean by that? A means no millennium and post means the church will bring in the millennium and Christ will come afterwards. Either way, in those two positions, there is the belief in a final resurrection for everybody, what we could call a general resurrection, followed then by a final general judgment of everyone, either to eternal life or eternal judgment, and followed then by a new heaven and new earth. And so both uh, post-millennialism, in my understanding, came somewhat later. The first view came probably during the end of the 1800s, influenced by Plymouth Brethrenism, <clears throat> that is the pre-tribulational uh, point of view, followed by the premillennial. The historic premillennial point of view, it is believed, was believed early in the church, some of the church fathers, but not universally. And the position that seemed to be more universal in the church uh, through time would be the amillennial position, held by Augustine, held by John Calvin, held by uh, Martin Luther, and so forth. So the great, can I say, thinkers of the church were probably no doubt from what we can tell, no millennium, believing in a general resurrection, a general judgment, followed by a new heaven and new earth. So I would like to just simply share what people who believe that believe. I'm not trying to convince anyone to follow that position or any of the position. None of them should be put on the level of the divinity of Jesus or the Trinity. And, uh, but I think it's fair to have this other exposure because we hear so little of it. In presenting it, one would start with Jesus and how Jesus in the parables of the, of the uh, sower and the bad soil. And at the end of time, at the end of the age, when Jesus interprets the parable of the weeds in Matthew 16, he talks about how he would come uh, at the end of the age with his angels who would be the reapers, the son of man, 
and then he would separate the wheat from the tares. And the amillennial position would ask, how do we have tares around if we have another thousand years of Christ reigning upon the earth and evil continuing? Uh, and in Judaism, you had two ages, ha'olam haya, ha'olam haba, the age that is, the age that is to come. The age that is to come was the messianic age, which would be the new heaven and new earth age, according to uh, the uh, position of amillennial eschatology. Coupled with this is also the teaching of Jesus in the sheep and the goats. This position believes that when Jesus returns, we have similar imagery described <laughs> that the Son of Man will come and he will come with his angels in verse 31. And he will gather together everybody, both sheep and goats, and then there will be the final separation. And the sheep will be uh, told, as much as you've done it under one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And those who hold this position believe that he's referring to a reference in Matthew 10, that the brethren would be those emissaries of the gospel. And those who receive what they put out are showing, or who receive them, I should say, are showing that they receive the message by receiving the messenger. Then Jesus, it is said in John 5, talked about not only a general judgment, but a general resurrection preceding that judgment. And John 5 would be the text that, uh, that this position would appeal to. Marvel not, in verse 28, Jesus taught, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear my voice, will hear his voice, that is the voice of the Son of God, and they will come forth. They who have done good unto a resurrection of life, and they who have done worthless things unto a resurrection of judgment. So those who hold this position would simply say, everybody is going to be raised. And there will be two, can I say, uh, two things that will happen. There'll be a resurrection into life, and a resurrection and the judgment, not separated by a long period of time, but happening at the same time, that there will be a general judgment, either to eternal life or to eternal judgment. And the basis of that will be uh, the works. Works don't save, but works show, can I say, the validity of faith in the teaching of Jesus. I think that needs to be made clear because Jesus clearly said, uh, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. And it's not by works of righteousness, which we do, but can we say, if there's fire in the fireplace, there should be smoke coming out of the chimney. The fire in the fireplace is faith in Jesus. The smoke coming out of the chimney would be the works that accompany that faith, showing the validity and the reality of that faith. But the general resurrection, determining uh, those that will have eternal life, and those, sad to say, that will not. But then as we move on into the New Testament, those who hold this position would then go to the Apostle Paul. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talks about the coming of the Lord. By the way, there's three words in Greek, parousia, arrival, epiphania, manifestation, and apocalypsis, apocalypsis meaning unveiling are used together to describe this great event. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about the coming of the Lord. And as he does, he says that when he comes, he has to reign until he put all enemies under his feet. Uh, to Paul, Jesus, it is said, is now reigning in heaven at the Father's right hand, Psalm 110, verse 1. But when he comes back, there will be then the final putting away of death. And so he comes back, and when he comes back with his angels, there's not only the final judgment, but the final defeat of death itself, Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, if there is a millennial position, how does one experience not only tears, but also death during the millennium? If Christ's return, there's an end 
uh, brings an end to death. Also, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul seems to clearly, to in this position, uh, they feel, talk about a general uh, coming, a general judgment. When he says, those who have afflicted you <clears throat> will be afflicted, and to you that are being afflicted, there'll be rest in the apocalypse, in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his angels. Again, there is that final judgment and final eternal life at the revelation, which is parallel to the parousia or the arrival. So Paul, it is believed by this position, teaches the same thing. One general coming with his mighty angels, one general final resurrection. This is then uh, also uh, taught, many believe, in Second Peter where Peter describes the coming of the Lord followed by a new heaven and new earth. In other words, in 2 Peter chapter 3, there's no intervening event, this position would say, such as a millennium, but Christ returns and there is that new heaven and new earth. So how does this position deal with Revelation 19, which becomes the key text in support of the premillennial position. Uh, those who hold this position will say, let us go with the gospels and the clearer teaching of Jesus and not try to explain them by saying maybe Jesus is just telescoping, but let's look at it and then go to Revelation in that highly apocalyptic uh, style of writing and agree with Augustine who felt that the thousand years was a symbol of the reign of the martyrs with Christ from his resurrection to his second coming. And so a theologian like Hodge, who taught at Princeton, who was post-millennial but did not believe in a literal millennium, uh, taught that uh, this would be his approach. He would rather interpret revelation by the gospels, uh, rather than the gospels by revelation. And the other thing that is said, uh, you have this in Erickson, and not only Erickson who is reformed, but also in those that are non-reformed. I'm looking at my library here, and I'm looking at uh, Milly, M-I-L-E-Y, who is one of the great theologians of the Arminian position, who believes the same, one general coming, one general day of resurrection, and then followed by a new heaven and new earth. So again, all of these, whether Reformed theology, whether Reformed theologians like Calvin and Luther, or whether we're looking at Arminian theologians like uh, Milly, hold the same idea, that the Lord is coming with his angels, there'll be a final resurrection, final day of judgment, and uh, the thousand years then look at they would agree with Augustine, the reign of the martyrs with Christ now until the second coming, being the first resurrection. And one of the appealing texts would be in John, I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he zao, yet shall he live, being the first resurrection. And the one who believes in me, though he die, uh, excuse me, not only will he live, but he who lives, and believes in me will never, ever die forever. Speaking of the second resurrection, at least one possible text that <laughs> some would use to explain uh, Revelation 20 by the teaching of Jesus. So the big question then is, do we interpret Revelation uh, 20 as the standard, and then, which is in highly apocalyptic, as Erickson says, there's no mention of earth here. It's the angels or the martyrs reigning with Christ. Or do we interpret this text by uh, the, the teaching of Jesus, which he would describe as the clear teaching about the Son of Man coming with his angels, final judgment, separation of wheat from tares, sheep from goats, etc. The final problem is the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. 
And those who hold to the premillennial position would say to the amillennialists, well, look, you're spiritualizing the prophecies of the Old Testament. Their response would be this, Jesus spiritualized many times when he said, not on this mountain or on this mountain, but in spirit and in truth, you will worship John 4. Also, when Jesus <laughs> said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. Speaking of his resurrection, uh, excuse me, when he said, destroy this temple, uh, and, and it's talking about himself and the resurrection that he would bring about in John 2. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. So again, Jesus, it is said, had no problem with speaking, can I say, symbolically or let's say applicationally of what looked like a literal temple to their mind, speaking of a spiritual uh, uh, resurrection and temple that he would build in the church. So the question then is, does one interpret, uh, the amillennial position would, would ask, does one interpret the Old Testament by the new, or does one interpret the new by the old? And they would say, we want to interpret the Hebrew scriptures by the New Testament, by progressive revelation. As to the book of Revelation then, uh, which Revelation 19 and 20, according to the amillennial point of view, would be part of the cyclical, if one takes that approach to the book of Revelation, that both Armageddon and the return of Christ in 19 at the great white throne judgment are two parallel texts looking again at the final second advent of Christ. When he judges the world by his cross in John 19, uh, the blood of the cross, and then in, excuse me, in Revelation 19, and then in Revelation 20, judging the world by their works. Meaning, again, John 5, works don't save, but works, according to this position, declares whether one has saving faith or not, which is only in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the smoke coming out of the chimney, becoming the basis of judgment, whether there was fire in the fireplace in the first place. So I wanted to give an overview. Uh, and again, you don't have to agree with this position. I want to just share, this is what many have believed throughout church history. And many of the giants of the Christian faith, such as Augustine, as I said, uh, Calvin and Luther. And it's sad that many of these men would not be able to teach in some of our schools because they would not have followed a certain type of eschatology that believed in, let's say, pre-tribulational rapture or premillennial, uh, uh, kind of say, historical uh, eschatology, but were no doubt amillennial in their theology. So I wanted to share that and uh, at least expose people. What about then the promises of land in the Hebrew Bible? Uh, many who hold this amillennial position would say that will be realized in a new heaven and new earth. It's like Jesus, it's like the Hebrew prophets talking about an ice cream cone and God giving them a final Sunday in a new heaven and new earth where both Jews and Gentiles, the church of Jesus Christ, all, whether Jew or Gentile, will be reigning with Christ throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity in a new heaven and new earth. To my knowledge, in Judaism, there's no teaching of a temporal time, of a millennium uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, in their interpretation. They would simply say, you know, we accept that literally some would, but we don't see that there's going to be an interim period of a thousand years. That's what you Christians believe, but we don't see that in the Hebrew Bible at all. So the all millennial position would say, we're agreeing with the Jewish interpreters at that point. We don't see the Hebrew Bible teaching an interim period, and therefore we feel Revelation chapter 20 needs to be interpreted uh, rather like Augustine did rather than the other way around. Thank you. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, it has nothing to do with one's eternal salvation. That is only through faith in Jesus Christ. It is troubling to me 
that you never hear this point of view taught hardly today, at least in public uh, kind of uh, teaching among a lot of evangelical teachers. So I wanted to share it. It's been a position of godly people through the centuries, uh, not only the reformers, but Arminian scholars as well. Thank you so much.